We've had our fair share of TV shows about dysfunctional families, like The Simpsons, The Sopranos, The Griffins from Family Guy, and just about everybody in Game of Thrones. But one of the most unique groups has got to be the Hargreaves family from the Umbrella Academy. Not only were the Hargreaves kids unusual from birth, being born to mothers who went from zero to birthing in about six seconds, but they all had special powers. Powers which their adoptive father, Sir Reginald Hargreaves, took advantage of to form a superhero team. While that might sound awesome to your inner ten-year-old, the truth was anything but. After one of the kids comes back from traveling to the future, the family has to patch up the differences and save the world from the apocalypse. Oh, is that all? While both the show on Netflix and the comic series created by My Chemical Romance frontman Gerard Way have similar characters and plot lines, it's the execution of the overall story that really drive them apart. And while I may have a clear favorite between the two, I thought both stories were told in fun, engaging ways. Starting off, we have the comic series, written by Gerard Way and illustrated by Gabriel Ba. Volume 1 was published in 2007 by Dark Horse Comics, the same company that brought you Hellboy, the American translation of Berserk, and a buttload of franchise tie-ins. Way has stated that his work was inspired by other comics, perhaps most of all by Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol. There are currently three volumes available, with a promised fourth coming soon. In their unending crusade to make literally every movie that they can, Netflix eventually scooped up the film rights to the Umbrella Academy, but wisely chose to turn it into a series instead of a single movie, a move that I wish more adaptations would take. Of course, Netflix likes to use the shotgun approach of hitting up whatever series they can get their hands on and hoping that it turns out well, which often results in some really, really bad choices. For God's sakes, they're making the live-action version of Sword Art Online! God damn it! However, there was some strong talent in the writer's room this time, as The Umbrella Academy is one of the strongest rewrites I think I've ever seen. The first season of the show is a mild combination of the first two volumes of the comics, with the plot taken from the first volume and several characters and plot elements taken from the second. The series gave us awesome action, nicely intertwining plot lines, conflicts with dramatic stakes, good comedy, great special effects, and some of the best character work I've seen on screen in a long time. Premiering in 2018, the series was one of the best products that Netflix has ever put out, with a second season confirmed for July 31st. At least we have one thing to look forward to this year. Because this is a TV series, we're going to tackle this review a little differently. First off, we're not going to look at the story chronologically. There are so many background stories, character arcs, and plot lines that we'd be here all day if I tried. Second, I want to stress that there will be some mild spoilers, and I highly recommend you check out at least the show if you haven't already. And third, I might as well open with this. I kind of prefer the show over the comics. There's plenty to like about the comics, and the art, while not to my particular taste, is very stylistic and fits the story well. However, it's the complex and deep way the show handles the characters that caused me to love it. Especially one character above the rest, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So what makes these stories so great? Well, let's wallow in a pit of emotional despair because our adopted father never hugged us. This is The Umbrella Academy. To start, the show got a complete overhaul. A very simple rundown of the plot comes down to stopping the apocalypse and dealing with a group of time-traveling mass murderers. These elements were separate in the comics, but they work surprisingly well together, with the time travelers working to ensure the apocalypse happens. The show still took plenty of liberties, though. The comics provide frequent flashbacks to when the Umbrella Academy was in its prime as kids. You know, before all the horrible drama sank in. This was one area that I thought the books did better than the show, because they were always much bigger in scale than what the show provided. The show treated the foundation of the Academy and their past as a backstory and didn't really go into that much detail. The comics gave us these ridiculous Golden Age era adventures that were over in a few pages, but were still fun openings, like when the kids took on a giant Abraham Lincoln statue. I can understand why these scenes were cut from the show, since it also presented Hargreaves as kind of a proud papa who congratulated the kids in a stern, proper manner, which conflicted with the uptight stuffed shirt the show wrote him to be. Plus, the kids always got ice cream for saving the day. Ice cream is happy, and this show is not about being happy. I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention the comic's villains. The show did have some supervillains and some time-traveling assassins to fight, but it feels like the Academy mostly fought average bank robbers and low-life thugs. The comics gave wildly colorful and oftentimes ridiculous archfiends for the siblings to counter, most of whom are introduced in the third volume. There's Dr. Terminal, who created a device to convert matter into raw energy to fend off a rare brain condition of his, and sometimes uses humans to fuel it. There's the Murder Magician, whose methods of murder are mightily magical. There's the Sequin Skull, who just... 
I don't know, man. Most of these guys are weird, but they do give the comics a fun, oddball personality. Both the show and the comics used in medias res to start off, which means that the audience is introduced in the middle of things. There's a lot of backstory for the characters in the world, but both mediums make the most of this. Clever dialogue in the show and little hints in the comics detail a complex web of backstories for the characters. Those backstories are what really drive the story, with characters butting heads over past differences or struggling with whatever mess they haven't cleaned up yet, like Allison's recent divorce or Luther's unquestioning devotion to his adopted father. Speaking of backstories, the show limited itself to quick, pointed scenes to give depth for character arcs, while the comics had more room to dedicate to some more diverse subplots and side stories. For example, there was the time Diego and Vanya started a band with a monkey and considered leaving the superhero lifestyle to pursue a music career. While both mediums use intertwining plot lines to tell their stories, the show has more plot lines and character arcs that all come together beautifully in the end, while the comics can be summed up with an A plot and a B plot. Both formats work just fine, but I'm more impressed with the show's ability to juggle so many balls in the air and still make sense. One of the best ways for any story with a fantasy edge to stand out is through their magic system. These can cover a broad range of styles, like FMA's alchemy, the mutant powers from the X-Men, bending from Avatar, and of course, the elementary breakdown of magic from Harry Potter. However, one thing that's really important to keep in mind is a sense of balance. You don't want your characters to be too powerful, because then they won't get challenged and the threats they face would seem underwhelming. With that in mind, I'd argue that the powers were much more balanced in the show than in the comics. The show kept things as straightforward as they could, rarely going overboard with convoluted alterations or expansions to the characters' powers. Luther's super strength, Allison's rumor whispers, Diego's pinpoint accuracy with throwing knives, and Number Five's ability to mimic Hero from Heroes. <laughs> there are exceptions, but I don't want to go that deep into spoilers. For the most part, the powers were kept pretty simple and helped define who the characters were. The comics didn't have as much balance, though. Some characters' powers are so overwhelming that they defy reason in both regards to world building and storytelling. I can accept when villains are overpowered since that creates a greater obstacle for the heroes to overcome. It's part of the reason why Thanos was such an amazing antagonist. However, when the heroes are overpowered, it can drain the tension of the plot. You might think that Allison's rumor power was all about mind control, but that's just how the show used it. In the comics, she can make someone's head explode just by suggesting it. And we see that she can also affect reality, like when she asks the store clerk for the product he's supposedly out of, and it just happens to appear from behind the counter. And that's without discussing the walking plot device that is Klaus. His ability to commune with the dead was only one of several abilities he had. That was largely what the show relegated him to, a junkie who could just make any psychic out there look like the manipulative douchebags they are. Here he is, the biggest douche of the universe. But the comics went so far with him that he's just a walking plot convenience. Wrote yourself into a corner? Can't think of a way to get Klaus away from the deranged serial killers? Well now he's immune to headshots! Can't think of a way to get rid of those same killers? Well now he can possess people and gets them to commit suicide! Need someone to stop a meteor from hitting the planet? All of a sudden, without any setup, Klaus is an insanely powerful telekinetic. Need Klaus to send a distress call? Now he can send his gooey spirit through the TV! I know how that sounds, but I can't think of any better way to describe it. Reading the comics made me appreciate the restraint the screenwriters used, since the characters really have to figure things out for themselves and don't routinely luck out with random new powers that just spawn when the plot line needs it the most. I mean, Klaus got shot in the head and was walking around just fine an hour later. You make it sound like death is no consequence. It really doesn't. In short, the characters in the comics have much bigger and more imaginative powers, but the show's limitations put them to better use, which made for a more tense and engaging story. Now, I wanted to have a whole section dedicated to the use of music in the show specifically, but thanks to YouTube's broken copyright system and the continued abuse thereof, I'll need to keep this short. There are too many asshats out there just itching to hit that flag button if you so much as use a single note from one of their songs. So with that in mind, I'd like to give a special fuck you to Sony, who has so enthusiastically combed through my channel for every crumb of ad revenue that I've had to private a third of my book was better reviews. Thanks for that, you miserable fuckwits. Enjoy the fourth circle. I hope when Lucifer gets around to you, he gives you cavity searches that go all the way up to his shoulder. Anyway, music is used well in the show. Most of it carries the scene along well, complementing the setting of the characters and heightening the emotions for the audience to get absorbed in. But that's standard fare for TV and movies, it's nothing to write home about. 
What the show really shines in, though, is its use of select classics. Songs like Queen's Don't Stop Me Now, Nina Simone's Sinner Man, and even Leslie Gore's Sunshine, Lollipops, and Rainbows are all used to prop up fight scenes. I know it sounds like some of those shouldn't work, but they really do. While Istanbul, not Constantinople, by They Might Be Giants, has nothing to do with Five's battle in the donut shop, the snappy energy and quick tempo highlight the action really well. The music is big, it helps carry the story, and it'll bring you back to relive multiple scenes after you finish the series. The biggest change between the mediums would be what happened to the characters, who were all widely expanded upon in the show. Even Agnes, the friendly waitress from the donut shop, got more of a storyline. I'd love to talk about the intricacies between the characters, how their arcs intertwine with others, and the siblings' relationships to one another, but if I did that, we'd be here for several hours, so we're just gonna stick to the basics. What can one say about the head of the Umbrella Academy? Well, he's very prim and proper, he's very emotionally distant, he has good intentions but uses terrible means in reaching his goals, and he's an alien. No, I don't mean the European kind, I mean the space kind. While the show seems to hint at this possibility, it didn't go into details about his real origins, but the comic opened up by announcing that he was from Beyond the Stars. It then proceeded to do nothing with this tidbit for the first two volumes. There's also the issue of his namesake monocle. While it was just a small clue and a larger mystery in the show, the comics treated it as a magical shortcut for the plot. Number 5 puts it on at one point and is able to uncover hidden secrets. There's still plenty of things we don't know about the monocle, but it could very easily become a major plot point in the future. And that's largely it. There isn't too much to say about Hargreaves, thanks in large part to him dying right at the start of the story. <laughs> Number one, or Luther, is played by Tom Hopper. The show puts his super strength on full display thanks to his inhumanly large arms and shoulders. The comic is even less subtle, dressing him up in a giant gorilla bodysuit that makes his head look positively tiny. The show explains that he had to be injected with a healing serum that contains some primate DNA, which had some adverse effects. <coughs> Credit where it's due, though, the muscle suit that Hopper wears for the show fits him so well that he kind of looks weird without it. Conversely, in the comics, his head was just planted directly onto a Martian Abe's body after a mission went wrong. Yeah, the comics have a metric ton of weird stuff that the show never even touches. At one point, the Eiffel Tower is turned into a spaceship, and they have to stop the zombie robot architect Gustav Eiffel from using it to escape Earth. Luther was a stern figure at the start of the story, and he's the only one of the siblings still loyal to their father. He was the de facto leader in the field and maintained the team. Well, until they all started splintering apart to live their own lives outside of being superheroes. Actually, quick side note while it's on my mind. To help with the superhero personas, all the siblings, except Vanya, were given call signs. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Um, I'm Spider-Man, then. These did exist in the show, but were used pretty heavily in the comics. Most of them make sense, but some require a bit of context. Luther, for example, was Space Boy, or Space for short. They called him that in the show, and it felt like a reference to Luther starting the story while he was on the moon. In the comics, he chose that codename because he was declared the youngest person ever to get launched into space during a mission early in his superhero career. Apart from how he looked, he was actually one of the more consistent characters between both mediums. His arc involves a loss of faith in his father, and by extension, his mission as a hero. This arc happened a little more quickly in the comic, with his need to help his family keeping him going. Although he did spend some time as a rotund couch potato. Number two is Diego, played by David Castaneda. Going into the series, I thought Diego was going to be my favorite character. He's a vigilante whose powers are about throwing things with insane accuracy. He's like a more narrowly constructed version of Bullseye, but his rebellious attitude is what saves him from obscurity. His powers can actually affect more than just knives, but those are mostly what we see him use. His codename honestly doesn't make any sense to me. It's the Kraken, and if you've seen the show, that's what you would think they would call Ben, number six. Now I checked in on this, and the Wikipedia article says that Diego also has the power to hold his breath indefinitely, and that might be where they got his name. Krakens are deep sea monsters. I get it. I don't get it. It's even more confusing because his breath holding ability never really comes up. I mean, he swims a few times, but it's never implied that he doesn't come up for air. He's very much a loner in both mediums, isolating himself from his siblings more times than not. 
He constantly butts heads with others, especially Luther. In both stories, the only person Diego relies on is a cop, though the context is different in both. In the comic, he gets information from Inspector Lupo, who's partnered with a talking monkey named Body, Diego's old bandmate. In the show, the cop is Eudora Patch, Diego's former partner and love interest. Though broken up, Diego still has feelings for her, so when she gets hurt early in the show, he takes on a personal vendetta to avenge her. He does need to learn to open up and let others help him, so his arc is about cooling his head and working with others. Number three is Allison, played by Emmy Raver Lantman. Allison is the only character whose life was going in a positive direction, at least for a little while. The problem with it is that it was based on a mountain of lies. She had a wonderful husband, Patrick, a daughter, Claire, but at the start of the show, she'd lost both of them to a bitter divorce. Her arc is all about what happens when you abuse your power. Her codename is The Rumor, and her main power is being able to control people's actions and thoughts when she starts a sentence with, I However, her comic counterpart is ridiculously more powerful, to the point where she accidentally conjured a second version of herself, so the show kept Allison more down to earth, where she had to rely on her wits more than her powers to sort through her problems. She seemed hesitant to use her powers, considering how many problems they actually caused, despite how strong she was. I would argue that it was a nice change, considering how overpowered she was in the comics. There, her powers pretty much came down to press X to hack the planet. Hack the planet! Yeah! Hack the planet! Out of the rest of the Academy, though, she probably has the most complex relationships with her siblings. She's the closest to Vanya, the only other woman in the family. Yay, sisters. Yay, sisters. Plus, she and Luther share a secret affection for each other. And I have to remind the incest is wincest crowd that these two are adopted and are not actually related. Damn it! She was a little more involved in the core plot in the comics and was uniquely qualified in the second volume. Number four is Klaus, played by Robert Sheehan. Klaus is the best character in the show. Klaus is the black sheep of the family, but through the course of one season forces himself through enormous change. He starts out lower than anyone else. He's constantly stoned. He's a thief and sells heirlooms for drug money. He's homeless. He ignores several social norms. And he's severely traumatized from his childhood. For God's sakes, his father's idea of training was locking him in a mausoleum overnight. Seeing him struggle against all of that, then stand up to his personal demons and turn into a pillar of support for the rest of the siblings made him an inspiration. I don't want to spoil it because of how great the reveal was, but halfway through the show, Klaus finds something to improve himself for. It's worth getting clean for, and he strives to do the right thing because of it. His powers in the comics, though, are whatever the plot needs them to be. In the show, he just speaks to the dead, like a less douchey version of John Edwards. I'm not a douche! But when I say he spoke with the dead, it was more like they came rushing at him, demanding attention, some looking the way they did when they died. Some with exposed wounds and covered in blood. Little wonder why he was so messed up. <laughs> he never got the hang of his powers, so he's constantly haunted by people screaming for justice. He dopes himself up to stifle his powers, always putting on a happy face, despite how incredibly miserable he was. Sheehan absolutely nailed this role, conveying a happy-go-lucky appearance while at the same time smothering a deep, crippling torment. He was quite the different person in the comic, though. He never suffered the becoming something from nothing fight that he does in the show. In fact, after the events in Volume 1, he's so successful and famous that he almost has his life in order. It's not until Volume 3 that he starts to really spiral out of control, resorting to drugs and running scams with a nefarious biker gang to cheat people out of their money. If you need an argument for the show being better than the comics, look no further than Klaus. Funny, chaotic, deep, and more feeling than the rest of the Academy, Klaus really is the king of the show. While Klaus may have been my favorite character, Aiden Gallagher, who plays number five, is my favorite actor. He does an incredible job playing this no-nonsense character. Despite his diminutive size, when he tells you he'll hurt you, one look in his eyes tells you he's not kidding. He may look like a kid, but he's actually the oldest member of the Academy, thanks to a time-traveling mishap that got him trapped in the future for several decades. He was eventually able to return to the present by pushing his powers to the extreme, along with some faulty math. This was another way Gallagher earned top acting credit, since he really does come off as an impatient senior trapped in a kid's body. Sort of like Zachary Levy in reverse. I'd like to purchase some of your finest beer, please. The time-traveling mishap is actually one of the ways the plot gets started in both mediums. While Hargreaves' funeral is what brought the family together, 
It's number five's obsession with stopping a global extinction event that drives the central plot. When I jumped forward and got stuck in the future, do you know what I found? No. Nothing. He's the main reason why half the story is able to carry on, and a lot of his mannerisms were kept over from the comic. He's short-tempered, great at killing, and really doesn't care about what anyone else thinks. He was a little toned down in the show. The comic showed him getting drunk or contract killing. He had a very apathetic attitude towards others, though not quite going into full-on nihilism. At one point, he gets a squad together to help with a time-traveling caper, and outright tells them that the plan was to sacrifice all of them to reach the end goal. His powers might come down to being able to teleport anywhere, with limited control in regards to time, but he's also the perfect killer. His run-in with the Temps Commission, known as the Temps Aeternalis in the comics, left him with unnatural abilities thanks to various experiments and modifications. Through a combination of time travel and mad science, he was the embodiment of every serial killer in history. All that chaos in such a small package, all that's missing is the bow. Number six is Ben, portrayed by Justin H. Min. Ben is the most mysterious member of the Umbrella Academy because he's dead. How and why he died is currently unknown, even by the end of the comic's third volume. He shows up in some side stories and flashback scenes, as well as one encounter with Klaus in the present day, but that's about it. We see in both the comics and the show, he appears as a young adult, so his death must have happened sometime shortly before the start of the story. Oh, there are worse things that can happen. You mean like what happened to Ben? Was it bad? His codename was Horror, and his powers were being able to summon extraplanar demon tentacles. In the comics, he doesn't really show up, or even get mentioned that much, but in the show, he's a constant companion for Klaus, hovering around, criticizing his adopted brother, and trying to offer advice that usually goes ignored. Still, the back and forth he shares with Klaus, the only one who can see him, gives Ben plenty of time to get fleshed out, so by the end of the show, he has a much bigger impact than you might think. Finally, number seven is Vanya, played by Ellen Page. Vanya is the odd one out of the group, most notable for her complete lack of any powers. Starting out, her ordinary life is what defines her. In fact, the title of her autobiography is Extraordinary. Her arc is all about the emotional and social neglect that she suffered from as a child. Why can't I go play with the others? We've been through this before, number seven. I'm afraid there's just nothing special about you. Even though she doesn't have any powers, or perhaps because she doesn't, Vanya is never really included in the family, short of a few sisterly encounters with Allison. When the rest of the Academy meets up to discuss what to do about the looming apocalypse, they don't bother waiting for Vanya. The only time she's really included by her siblings is during Hargreaves' funeral. She's completely average, lives in a boring apartment, and she plays the violin, but she's just okay at it. She doesn't have any real support until she meets Leonard, the kinda strange loner who takes a sudden interest in her. In the comic, she was approached by The Conductor, whose interest in her violin play might have some sinister undertones. This, however, creates an identity crisis for Vanya, with implications that last through Volume 3 of the comics. Either way, Vanya's arc shows that with the right support network, you could be harboring world-changing talents. One last set of characters before we end, because I can't leave these two unmentioned. After all, what's a great story without great villains? Easily, one of the biggest changes had to be what the show did with Hazel and Cha-Cha, played by Cameron Britton and Mary J. Blige, respectively. The most obvious difference is that in the show, you see the pair without their masks on. The ridiculous dog and bear masks were never removed in the comics. In the comic, these two were sugar-addicted, psychotic murderers. They worked for the Temps Commission, a group bent on keeping time on a single, controlled track, which meant they got to go through time, meet interesting people, and brutally slaughter them. Their rampant insanity was a little hard to predict, but that just added to their unique charm. One moment they're enjoying some delicious apple pie, the next, they've literally torn the arms and legs off the chef to get the recipe. Oh, and to get info about a target they were hunting, but we do get to learn that the secret of the recipe was canned apples. They were polar opposites in the show, though. Rather than enthusiastic killers, they were more like overworked office employees, always complaining about their expense budgets getting cut or how their boss just doesn't get it. Now, they were still extremely skilled assassins. Stern, deadly, very tough, and usually great at their jobs, until they ran into the academy. They were more down to earth, with Chacha itching to just finish the job and Hazel thinking about retirement. Watching them was like watching bored DMV workers murder and torture people, all while arguing over standard protocol. 
They were weirdly humanized for a pair of time-traveling assassins, which is a lot of what made them so enjoyable. First they cut our per diem and then our dental, and now we don't even get our own rooms. Where does it end? They felt a tad underutilized in the comics, despite how impactful they were. Neither of them were around for too long, and they were both taken out pretty easily. They didn't have an arc in the comic, though Hazel had one in the show. Cha-Cha just wanted to finish up their job and move on to the next mission, but Hazel was tired of it all and wanted to retire. He had a change of heart when he ran into Agnes at the donut shop, but you don't leave a group of corporate time-traveling assassins without a little trouble. And that was just a portion of what they changed when adapting the story. There are still plenty of differences to note, like what they did with the head of the Temps Commission. In the show, she's a 1950s businesswoman called The Handler, and in the comic, he's actually Minion from Megamind. Hell, I didn't even mention Pogo, the monkey butler, or Grace, the robotic substitute mother. Just be glad I didn't mention that time in the comics when Number 5 coped with his dread by drunkenly watching a monkey strip tease as Marilyn Monroe. Yes, that happens. The comics definitely have more weirdness and classic comic oddities, but the show also has a lot of great action scenes and awesome music. Both are worth checking out depending upon what kind of story you want. The show is fantastic, even among modern superhero stories. It's not as bombastic as a Marvel movie, and not as bleak and cold as most DC films, so it's able to stand neatly as its own kind of entity. The detailed character work is something to be admired. The impressive connections it makes, binding the Umbrella Academy with their siblings and their pasts, makes for compelling drama and gripping action. Stellar acting and excellent dialogue make the characters feel incredibly fleshed out. Seriously, check the show out if you haven't. Season 2 is coming July 31st, and hopefully it can live up to the first season, which earns a 5 out of 5. I'm not really a comics guy, you need to ask Linkara about that, but I do like what Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba made together. The art is highly stylized, giving the comics a unique identity, and the story is all over the place in terms of action, wacky adventures, and appealing characters. The story could be stronger, and the magic system is all kinds of broken, but not so much that it ruins the plot or characters. It's goofy, action comic fun, even if it doesn't always make sense. The comics get a 4 out of 5. Sometimes it's hard to really gauge how well an adaptation fares. While characters, places, and basic events all line up well enough between the mediums, a good portion of all of those have changed. The characters are more defined in the show, the powers are more limited with room to grow, but there isn't a wide range of insane villains for the actors to play off of. The show and comics tell different stories and reach out for different target audiences, with the show aiming for more mainstream appeal. Sacrifices had to be made, even if it was in the show's best interest for telling a more coherent, conclusive story. It's all part of the process when you're shifting genres. As an adaptation, The Umbrella Academy gets a 2 out of 5. So I hope you take the chance to check out The Umbrella Academy, both the show and the comics. Both stories are told really well and they act... Was that a G note? Strange as it is, My Chemical Romance really showed me just how much life sucks as a YouTuber. I know people think they can burn bright on this platform with their bulletproof heart, but the common people out there just suffer away in their cubicles until they wind up on Cemetery Drive. Heaven help us, but your famous last words might as well be, Welcome to the Black Parade. Sure, it's not all evil, but the algorithm is not a fashion statement, it's a freaking death wish. Susan Wojcicki just says, look alive, sunshine, and takes the light behind your eyes so you can kiss the ring. YouTube promised us tomorrow's money, but thanks to all the music companies peddling all this copyright drama, that ad revenue has turned into vampire money. I gave you blood. Gallons of the stuff! I've given all that you can drink and it has never been enough. So fake your death, because I'm not okay, I promise. Well, the kids from yesterday are gonna have a party at the end of the world, because the jet set life is gonna kill ya. The sharpest lives are just party poison. Oh, Our Lady of Sorrow, this 
is how I disappear. So what you think? That was the most condensed well of emo I think I have ever heard in my entire life. Thanks. I've been practicing for my one-man show. I go on after some guy who just says moist for 45 minutes. I can get you tickets if you want to watch. No, I'm going to be chanting in protest against you. What rhymes with fucking stupid?